Erica Sapphire is a professor at the La Jolla Institute of Immunology, one of the world's most influential medical research institutes. Her research explains at a molecular level how and why viruses are pathogenic and how to develop a roadmap for medical defense. Her team has solved the structures of the Ebola, Sudan, Marburg, Corona, and Lassa virus glycoproteins and explained how they remodel these structures as they drive themselves into cells and how the proteins suppress immune function where human antibodies can defeat these viruses. She was recognized at the White House as a presidential early career award winner in science and was the galvanizing force behind the viral hemor hemorrhagic fever immunotherapeutic consortium and is the director of this organization. This consortium, an NIH-funded center of excellence in trans translational research, unites 44 previously competing academic, industrial, and governmental labs across five continents to understand and provide antibody therapeutics against pathogenic viruses. Um, we're going to start today with Erica, who is going to talk about coronaviruses in, in general and what makes this one uh, particularly different. Erica? Thank you, Paul. So it's almost hard to believe we first heard about this new virus just six weeks ago when novel cases of viral pneumonia emerged in the Hubei province of China. So they emerged in the city of Wuhan, located over toward the east, and the first cluster of cases were linked to a seafood market there. That's this market here, where seafood and wild animals are, sale, are for sale that are both part of a legal and illegal trade. Now, because of the previous link of some of these species for sale in that clinic, I mean, that, that seafood market, to related viruses, the seafood market was immediately closed, and many of the different samples and types of meat were submitted for testing. So out of 585 samples taken from the market, 33 were found to be positive for the novel coronavirus. And so it was thought that the original, the origination of this virus was from that seafood market, but the later genetic testing showed that although the virus was definitely at that market, it, and it definitely propagated in some human-to-human -human transmission through that market, it likely originated somewhere else in the natural environment and some other animal to human spillover event. So this virus is what we call a zoonotic infection. Zoo for animal, it's a zoonosis. It's something that is not a natural human pathogen. It spills over from an animal host or animal reservoir to infect humans for the first time. If you look at the timeline of cases for this virus, you can see that some of the very first were not at all associated or didn't attend or didn't work at that market. And so there was a natural spillover from something in the environment in China. And then the cases shown in orange are the human-to-human -human transmission events associated with the market. And so they may have been humans that interacted with some other source of infection at the market, but if you look at the blue bars, it's something natural there. The transmission in the market starting somewhere else. Now, you and I have all had coronaviruses before. This shown here is NL63. Coronaviruses typically cause the common cold. And these four shown here with their acronym names are incredibly common. About 30% of the cases of the common cold are some coronavirus or another. And these viruses were such mild infections that no one really studied them much. And it was really difficult 20 years ago to get any research funding to explore coronaviruses because they weren't known to cause any significant human disease. Now, we do know now, this year more abundantly than ever, that dangerous ones do emerge. So the one called SARS emerged in 2003 in southern China, originating from this thing here. This is a palm or civet, a civet, it's kind of a cat sold for food in these live markets. SARS eventually expanded to about 8,000 people, causing about 800 deaths. A few years later, another coronavirus, MERS, emerged in Saudi Arabia with multiple introductions from camels spread to humans. And that ultimately infected about 2,500 people. So the name of the virus of this new one is SARS-CoV-2 because it's about 80% identical to the first SARS that we saw in 2003. The name of the disease that it causes is COVID-19. So that's like the virus is caused, called HIV and the disease is called AIDS. So that's what those two terms are. The SARS-CoV-2 is the actual virus. COVID-19 is the disease that it causes. We still don't know exactly where it came from. Probably a bat, and we think that by genetic similarity to other coronaviruses that circulate in bats in the area. 
It has some similar features to viruses from pangolin, but they don't think it was caused by a pangolin. It's different from other coronaviruses we know, but it has multiple genetic substitutions in its receptor binding site, and that will affect how it attaches to and enters human cells. It also has an introduction of a new cleavage site that could help the speed with which the virus infects cells. It has additional carbohydrates attached to it. But it looks like from these genetic changes that these are multiple natural mutations and natural recombination events. There are so many differences here that it would not have been possible for any human to have created them. This is a natural emergence which follows the pattern of multiple natural emergences we've seen of novel pandemic viruses. If you look at the timeline of the cases per day in China, you can see where it began in late December, where one of the doctors noted four cases of viral pneumonia in a cluster. And it takes a cluster for a doctor to pay attention and think this is something different here. The pneumonia was reported the next day. More pneumonia was noted shortly thereafter. And active case finding began just shortly after that. WHO was, WHO was notified at the end of December. The seafood market was closed. And so all of those were when the bars were still very small the bars of the number of cases. From then, it expands. The sequence was shared with the scientific community. At this point in time, the city of Wuhan was shut down. Fifteen more cities were shut down. This is the normal Lunar New Year holiday, and the next point in time was the mandatory extension of that holiday where the Chinese government asked people to stay home. In green are the cases marked by day when their symptoms began. And in yellow are when the case is diagnosed. So you can see that the rise in bars and the rise in diagnosis occurred very much after the initial identification of the virus. So if you look at the map of the virus spreading from when they began tracking for this particular analysis in January 11 to the end of February, you can see how those cases are rising in China from a few to tens of thousands and how it's starting to spread around the globe. And this is what we typically would see for a respiratory virus. Always the worst case scenario for a novel pandemic is a respiratory virus because of the speed with which they transmit and our inability to avoid other humans and human contact entirely. It's now officially known as an actual pandemic. I'll go back with sustained human-to-human -human transmission on six continents. These are today's numbers with 122,000 infected. If you look at the bar graphs on the bottom, you can see the case graphs, the, the cases graphed in China on the orange line, people that have now recovered totaled in the green line, and the cases from the rest of the world now lagging behind China and starting to grow. So as time goes on, you would expect China to now have reached an asymptotic level where cases may start to drop. The number of recovered cases will exceed those and the rest of the world, we don't know what's going to happen. It will get worse before it gets better. At some point, and we don't know exactly when, cases will start to drop. But immunity to coronavirus doesn't last very long. Maybe two years is what we've seen for immunity last for SARS and MERS. So we do not know yet if this is going to become a common reoccurring virus and just part of our annual burden or something we will see once and then that will disappear, just like SARS. We can track genetically the transmission events and see where it's come from. And the question on everyone's mind is how lethal is it? So SARS was ultimately about 9.6% lethal. Uh, MERS, very high, 35%. We don't know exactly yet, the new virus, how lethal it's going to be. You can see the number of cases are certainly much higher and spreading much faster. And the reason we don't know something's going to be described by Dr. Senye later and how the inability to really know who has been mild and who has had an asymptomatic infection until later. Estimates of the cases have been 1 to 3.4 percent lethal. And that's a tremendous range, also higher. And some, we've seen some estimates of 10 percent in Italy. And the reason for the range depends on a lot of different factors. Just one of them is how the cases are counted. So a case fatality ratio is a fraction of the number of deaths over the number of the cases. So there's a numerator and there's a denominator, a number on the top and a number on the bottom. If you look at three countries of interest and those numbers at that point in time, in the South Korea figures, they have a very low case fatality ratio, 0.7%. They've had 34 deaths over 5,000 cases. But consider what would happen if they had done a different amount of testing. What if they ran fewer tests? 
What if they had noted those 30 deaths, because those are notable events, would have gone to a hospital, but they'd only tested 1,000 people, they would have concluded their case fatality ratio was 3%. If they had run more tests where they'd found the same 30 deaths, but let's say they'd found 15,000 cases, but many of them are mild or asymptomatic, they could only be identified with testing, they would can come up with the conclusion their case fatality ratio was 0.2%. So we won't really understand what the numbers are until we've done serology after the fact. There is a definite dis difference in the amount of testing done, where South Korea has done 2,000 tests for a million citizens, and uh, Italy fewer, and the United States even fewer yet. A few percent result in death. Most recover. Maybe 15 to 20 percent result in severe or clinical disease. And the way virologists are looking at it now is it's the little cowboy in the bar. The WHO is saying, hey, you, yeah, I'm talking to you. But to put it in perspective, these are the annual diseases that are spread by respiratory infections that we look at every year with a tremendous annual burden. Respiratory syncytial virus kills 14,000 people a year. Tuberculosis, 1.2 million. Measles, still 140,000. Influenza, seasonal influenza, 15 to 60,000 a year. And so we don't know yet if coronavirus will stay the little cowboy or if we'll get to be one of the larger recurring cowboys that we have. The estimate is that each case infects one to three other people. And we do know, in what was a good uh, biological experiment at this point, those cruise ships, 50 to 20 percent of the people on there became infected, even though they were told to stay in their rooms and many of them had masks. Respiratory infections, we know, do reach a large number of people. In 1918, the Spanish flu ultimately infected a third of the world's population. The Hong Kong flu in 1968 infected 2 to 15 percent of the globe, in some estimates, about 3.5 percent of Americans, with 34,000 American deaths. And we certainly travel much more than we did in 1968. And so the public health message is that this is coming. Can we slow it down? And the term being used is flatten the curve. Can we take the abundance of cases that we're expecting is going to happen, and through social distancing and washing hands and limiting exposure, push those number of cases that may be inevitable further out into the future so that we don't overwhelm health systems now. So we can make sure that the most critical cases are being treated and we're not turning people away. There were several vaccines in progress using different formats. Some use just genetic material. Some use purified proteins from the virus. Some display those molecules, like in blue and gray here is the surface molecule of the coronavirus. It's what makes the crown that gave coronavirus its name. Displaying that on a harmless replicating particles of that as, as a vaccine platform. These are all in progress. What's important to know is that it will be a year or two before these are available because they need to be subjected to testing to make sure that they are safe in their work, that they will work. And so what are we going to do for that intermediate one and two years? The best tools we have at our disposal are those social distancing and repurposing some other therapeutics that we may have had in progress that we could have developed previously for other viruses. There's one called remdesivir made by Gilead, which has shown efficacy against MERS virus, so it's being tested to see if it's efficacious against this novel coronavirus. There's another one called lopinavir or ritonavir, which is an inhibitor of the HIV protease already in HIV patients, and they're looking to see if it'll also inhibit a key protease of the coronavirus. Another molecule being forwarded are human antibodies. These are molecules made by your immune system in response to having survived an infection or is brought about by a vaccine. And if you can discover an antibody that would be effective, you can deliver them immediately, intravenously, and give somebody immediate immunity. And so that would be important to protect a frontline medical worker before a vaccine is available or to treat somebody who's already become seriously ill. Because this virus is expanding so quickly, what we need at this time is a rapid global framework to develop these more quickly and share resources and share data to put therapies in the hands of the people that need them. And so this is what I'm heading up over the next year is a global consortium to discover and deliver these antibody therapies. And I'm happy to now turn it over to our clinical discussion.